We're in our message series on the life of Jesus. We're going through everything that he did and everything that he said about who he is and what life is all about while he was here on the earth. And the life of Jesus is documented in four books that we find in the Bible. They're known as the Gospels. And today we're going to begin in chapter 12 of the Gospel of Mark. And I want to encourage you to be a skeptic today. Don't believe anything that I tell you. Study it for yourself. Examine the text. Determine if I'm presenting this to you honestly and accurately. You see, the question is not, is Jeff making the Bible what he wants it to say? Nor is the question, is Jeff making the Bible say what I want it to say? The question is, is Jeff allowing the Bible to say what it actually says? That's our goal today, to let the Word of God, the Bible, speak for itself. Last week we had the opportunity to listen in as Jesus delivered his final public message, his last public teaching, and what a teaching it was. He ripped apart the religious leaders of the day for creating a religion where there was supposed to be a relationship with God. They were substituting empty rituals for an actual relationship with God, and Jesus chastised them for doing the spiritual equivalent of cleaning the outside of a filthy cup while the inside remained dirty. And he said, that's what you're doing. You're worrying about everything you do on the outside, but the inside, your heart and your soul is a mess. This week, we're going to pick things up literally right after Jesus' interaction with those religious leaders. And Jesus is going to witness something that blesses him in stark contrast to the way the religious leaders were a woe to Jesus. And then we're going to move into the beginning of one of the most fascinating teachings in all of the Bible. It's Jesus talking about the end times. And I'm going to do my best to explain everything as we go, but some of what we're going to be discussing will assume that we have sort of a ground level foundational understanding of what the Bible says about the end times. And so if that's not you yet, pick up one of our free Revelation series USB jump drives in the back. Listen to our study through the book of Revelation. It's one of the most important things you can do. It's one of the most important books in the Bible. Or listen to it online on the website and get yourself up to speed. Let's jump in. Mark chapter 12. Let's find out what happens next. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. He's still on the Temple Mount, just finished chastising the religious leaders. He's in an area that's known as the Court of Women. It was one of the areas on the Temple Mount where women were allowed to go as well. And on one of the walls of the Court of the Woman were 13 trumpet-shaped receptacles. Basically, there was a trumpet, and then it went into the wall. And you could put an offering in there, and it would go onto the other side of the wall into a jar and be somewhere where the money was secured. And each of these 13 receptacles would be for a different purpose. One would be for tithes, one would be for the poor, one would be for building project, that sort of idea. And so Jesus is watching as different people come up and different people give monies. He's watching how they give. It says, and many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. Mites were very, very small copper coins, and two of them would together form a quadrants, which was the smallest unit of Roman currency. It was one sixty-fourth of a denarius, and a denarius was a standard day's wage for an unskilled worker. I thought, how can we translate this into today's terms? So if you made $20 an hour in the job that you do, and you worked an average of eight-hour days, these two mites would be the equivalent to $2.50 in our economy today. It says in verse 43, so he called his disciples to himself, brings the disciples around, and he said to them, he says, assuredly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who've given to the treasury, for they all put in out of their abundance, the word there actually means what was left over, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. In other words, that was it for this woman. She wasn't going to eat. She wasn't going to be able to buy anything else until she earned more money. This was everything she had. And I love this story. I absolutely love this story. And I'll tell you why. Don't miss the most shocking and astounding detail of the whole scene. 
based on what Jesus is telling his disciples, it's very obvious Jesus knows that this woman has put in everything she has. Are you tracking with me? He knows he has the supernatural insight. The Holy Spirit has told him what this woman has just put in is everything she has. Jesus knows that. I'm not blown away by what Jesus does. I'm blown away by the fact that Jesus does nothing. He does nothing. He doesn't run across the courtyard, grab her by the hand, and say, you don't need to do that. Your Father in heaven knows that that's all you have, and he would never ask you to give when you have so little. Jesus doesn't do that. Are you tracking with me how astounding that is? Why doesn't he do that? Why? It's because Jesus knows there's absolutely nothing in the world this woman could do with her resources that would profit and benefit her more than trusting God with them. So make a note of this. Jesus doesn't stop her from giving because he knows that trusting his Father is always the most profitable decision a person can make. He doesn't stop her from giving because he knows that trusting his Father is always the most profitable decision a person can make. He doesn't run across the courtyard and stop her because he knows there's no way that his heavenly Father is not going to come through in a huge way to honor this woman's faith. If Jesus had told her to hold on to her penny, she would still have what? A penny. She'd still have a penny. But as is true with all things in life, when you place them in God's hands, their potential becomes unlimited. You have the miraculous power of heaven at work in your situation. That's why I love this story so much. It's what tithing is all about. It's about learning to trust in our heavenly Father. Make a note of this. Jesus wasn't blessed by what she gave. He was blessed by how she gave. He wasn't blessed by what she gave. He was blessed by how she gave. And then let's unpack quickly three ways, three attitudes that she gave with that blessed the Lord Jesus. Firstly, write this down. She gave in faith. She gave in faith. She trusted that obedience to the Lord would benefit her more than hanging on to a little bit of extra cash. If you missed that, that's a gut shot for somebody. Not you guys here, but probably you know the people listening online later on. You see, when we don't tithe because money is tight, what we're really saying, I don't care how you dress it up, What we're really saying is, I believe these few extra dollars are going to do more to help me than God's blessing on my finances. I value this money more than I value the blessing of God. I believe this will help me more than the blessing of God. That's the bottom line, however you want to dress it up. When you cut through all the justifications we come up with, we have more trust in dollars and cents than we do in God's blessing. You see, this woman had faith that her heavenly father would take care of her. She believed that her provider was God. Let me ask you, who do you believe is your provider? Who do you trust to take care of you? Your tithing practices answer that question for you. They reveal the answer. Secondly, she gave sacrificially. Write that down. She gave sacrificially. The idea is that everybody else, everyone who's there who was wealthy, was giving out of what they had left over. And Jesus wasn't impressed. When we say, you know, this is another gut shot right here. When we say, I'll tithe when I make more money. What we're really saying is, I'll tithe when it doesn't hurt so much. When it's not so much of a sacrifice, when it doesn't mean I have to go without cable, when it doesn't mean I can't have a cell phone, when we say I'll tithe when I make more money, we're just really saying I'll I'll tithe when it doesn't hurt so much, when it's not so costly. When Jesus saw men who were giving in a way where it didn't cost them anything, he wasn't impressed. He was impressed by this woman's sacrificial faith. Let me be blunt here, as if I wasn't already, right? If your goal is not to be inconvenienced by tithing, then you should wait until you have more money. 
If that's your goal, if your goal is, I don't want to be inconvenienced by tithing. I don't want it to hurt at all. I don't want it to be a sacrifice. You should wait. Don't tithe yet. But if your goal is to bless God, you should tithe right now. And don't miss this. This is your next fill-in. She gave to God first. She gave to God first. She didn't give to God from what was left over. You see, the issue wasn't that all these other rich guys were giving out of their abundance. The issue was what's implied by the text is they were making their money, they were buying the things they want, then they were giving to God out of what is left over. Whereas the Bible talks about a principle called first fruits. And the idea was that even if you were a farmer, you had a field, the first tenth of your harvest was to go to the Lord. The first was to go to God, not what was left over. And Jesus is looking at this woman and he says, she gave to me first. All of these other guys gave to me last. It's an issue of priority. God gets the first, not what's left over. It's a principle, it's a heart issue to teach us that God is always first. And I understand that in our culture, the governments place themselves upstream from God so that they can get first dibs on your paychecks, but you can still make sure that you do the best you can with what comes into your hand. After a deadly plague had passed through Israel because King David had been disobedient to the Lord, David was instructed by the Lord to build an altar and make a sacrifice to him. So to do this as quickly as possible, David sought to buy this field from a man named Aravna. And when he heard the reason that David wanted the field, Aravna said, you just take it. You're the king. You're using this as a sacrifice to the Lord. I'd be blessed just to give this to you. And David, however, insisted on paying the full price. This is what he said in 2 Samuel 24, 24. David said, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price, nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. God loved that heart in David because it's the heart that blesses God when it comes to giving. God is not blessed when our heart is, how can I arrange my life and my income and my finances and my giving so that it doesn't cost me anything? So there's no sacrifice. God says, you're missing the entire point. The point is that it is a sacrifice, that you trust me and love me more than what you're sacrificing. That's the whole point. So if we're saying, man, I want to wait till I tithe till it's not a sacrifice, you're missing the whole point anyway. If you want to bless God, tithe where you are right now. Have you thought about this? How easy it would have been for this woman to have the attitude of, I'm not giving money to the temple. I'm not going to tithe. I'm a poor widow. I should be receiving money from the temple. They've got something right there for the poor. I'm poor. I should be getting, not giving. But she gave gladly and humbly recognizing that all she had belonged to the Lord. All she had belonged to the Lord. You see, she didn't know that Jesus was watching, but he was. And Jesus is watching when we give. More than that, he's watching how we give. He's watching how we give. Is it, God, thank you so much for taking care of me. Everything good in my life comes from you, and all I have belongs to you. Thank you for giving me something to give And for asking me to give that I might be set free from trusting in earthly things. Is that our attitude or is it, again, really? I can't believe you expect me to give when I've got so many bills to pay and money so tight. And what kind of God wants my money? He's watching how we give. He's watching how we give. It's not your money. It's not my money. It all belongs to the Lord. We're just simply obeying him and doing with his money what he's asked us to do. He said, I want you to give the first 10% back to me. Okay, it's your money. Did you catch that? Back to him. We're not just giving to him. We're giving it back to him. It already belongs to him anyway. It came from him ultimately. We sing songs about how everything we have belongs to the Lord. All that I am, everything I am belongs to you and phrases like that. If you're not willing to tithe, you need to stop singing those songs. You need to stop singing those songs because you're lying. Either everything we are and everything we have belongs to God or it doesn't. we got to decide. Which is it? He's been clear about what he wants us to do with the first 10% of our income. He wants us to return it to him. So let me ask you, do you think God took care of that widow after she trusted him? Of course. 
There's no way God didn't come through in an amazing way. I guarantee you when we get to heaven, we'll be blown away by the way the Lord provided for her. That's a good way to start a message right there. You can breathe now. Everybody just exhale. Everything's going to be all right. You see, if you're here and you're tithing, this is why I'm not scared to talk about money. Because if you're honoring God with your money inside, you're like, amen. If you're mad at me, you're not tithing anyway. So I don't really care that you're mad at me. You're in sin and you need to get right with Jesus, okay? That's why I'm not scared to talk about this stuff. So now, turn with me, if you would, to the Gospel of Matthew. Flip to Matthew. It's going to be back from Mark. Matthew's just going to be one book back. And we're going to be in chapter 24 of Matthew. This is what happens next. It says, Then Jesus went out, verse 1, and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings in the temple. So Mark and Luke's Gospels tell us that the the disciples were specifically pointing out the beautiful stones that decorated the temple and the glorious architecture of the buildings on the Temple Mount. And let me just give you an example. The gates of the Temple Mount were 130 feet high. 130 feet high. That makes Donald Trump's buildings look humble. 130 feet high. The main temple, get this. You guys know when when CNN or or Fox News or CBC does that panning shot from the Mount of Olives over Jerusalem, you always see the Dome of the Rock. It's that gold-domed mosque that sits on the Temple Rock right now, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The temple building was three times taller than the Dome of the Rock. Three times taller. The exterior walls were covered with marble on three sides, And the whole front side was covered in gold plates that reflected the morning sun and made the building visible for miles. And in fact, the Talmud says that you couldn't look at the front of the temple during the day without being blinded from the reflection of the gold. Additionally, the wealthy would give donations to the temple. If you're in part of a church building project where they're like, if you give $1,000 to the building campaign, you'll get a brick in the wall with your name on it. That sort of thing was going on even back at the temple. You could make a donation of a certain size and you'd get a plaque on the outside of the temple that was solid gold. And the wealthy would also give donations, artwork made of gold, sculptures, and other treasures. In fact, Herod, who was actually responsible for the building of this temple, this second temple, donated a golden vine with clusters of golden grapes that stood six feet tall. This huge thing. And these gifts would just be displayed on the exterior walls of the temple or hung in the portico area. So when you're walking around the temple mount proper, it's just like the most ridiculous collection of wealth and treasure that you could ever, ever imagine. It was incomprehensible. In fact, the value of the buildings, the treasures, and the materials of the temple would clock in today at over a trillion dollars, over a trillion dollars on the Temple Mount. And the disciples are pointing this out to Jesus, and they're they're wanting Jesus to affirm what they're saying. Like, isn't this amazing? They want Jesus to go, yeah, it's it's incredible. And the reason they want him to do this is because they've just heard Jesus talk before this about how Jerusalem and the temple are going to be left desolate, desolate. And so they're thinking, this This is the least desolate place on earth. This is the single greatest concentration of wealth on the planet. Jesus like, what what are you talking about? Basically, Jesus, admit that you sort of made a mistake. You you spoke out of turn. Verse 2, and Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, Jesus' answer would have been, Very disturbing to the disciples for obvious reasons. Just imagine this. And it would have seemed unbelievable for the stones of which the temple was constructed measured 12 feet high, 12 feet wide, and 40 feet long. Each one weighed between 250 and 400 tons, and they were so precisely cut that not even a knife blade could fit between them. However, many of you have heard about us, heard us talk about this before. Less than 40 years after Jesus spoke these words, General Titus Vespasian would storm Jerusalem with the soldiers of the Roman Empire with instructions to completely wipe out the city and its occupants. 
And although Titus commanded his soldiers not to desecrate or touch the temple, one of them threw a flaming torch into it, and the ensuing fire became so hot that the gold on the outside and the inside began to melt down the walls. And so to the Romans, it appeared that the rumors were true. The rumors that the Jews had used gold as mortar between the bricks of the temple. So once they see it start running down, they decide there's got to be gold between all of these bricks. And in their hyped up, worked up gold lust, they tear down every single stone in the temple to try and get this gold that they believe is between them. And they don't stop till they've pulled down every single stone. And in fact, if you go to Jerusalem today, all you'll see is the wailing wall that you've probably seen on TV. That's part of just the foundation of the Temple Mount. It's a massive wall. But what's really, really interesting too is you can still go to Jerusalem today and these stones that the Roman soldiers pulled down are still there, just off the Temple Mount in piles. They're so big, nobody's really bothered to move them. And it's pretty astounding because if you've been following the news, you know that the United Nations has just declared that the Temple Mount is a Muslim site and was originally a Muslim site, which is amazing since all these things are verified historical fact that occurred hundreds of years before Muhammad was even born. But again, I'm no historian. Make a note of this. Jesus prophesied the destruction of the temple, which would take place in 70 A.D., Little stuff like this, you know we read this and we think it's neat, but this is astounding. Jesus is prophesying specifically that the greatest structure in the world in 32 AD will be reduced to rubble in the near future, in the disciples' lifetime. It's an astonishingly specific prophecy that came true in an incredibly literal manner. And in Jesus' words about the temple lies a little reminder for you and I that is oh so important and it'll change the way that you live your life. It's this. The things in this world that impress you and I the most, the buildings, the wealth, the cars, the accomplishment, the fame, the houses, all of it is going to be reduced to less than rubble one day. Less than rubble. 2 Peter 3.10 tells us the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up, will be burned up. The things that we look at now and go, wow, that is amazing, are going to be reduced to nothing. You see, if your hope and your treasure are in the things of this world, you'll find yourself getting very angry and bitter as you age because you'll be confronted with your mortality and your inability to hold on to the things that you committed your entire life to acquiring. I was just reading an article a couple of weeks ago that Arnold Schwarzenegger is just bitter. He's just angry over what he says is the cruelty of life, that you work your whole life to build a life, and then it's taken from you by the unstoppable march of time and age. That's what happens when all your hope is in this world. You get to the point where you realize you can't even hold on to the very things you spent your whole life trying to get. However, if your hope is in the Lord and in the things of heaven, Aging is just moving closer to the things you've given your whole life to acquire. And so they make their way off the Temple Mount. Jesus leads them up onto the Mount of Olives, the hillside that provides the best panoramic view of Jerusalem. At its base is the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they're walking, the disciples are no doubt saying to themselves, what the heck was that about? Like, what is he talking about? The temple's going to be reduced to rubble? And they want answers, which is why we read in verse 3, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples, other gospels tell us specifically it's Peter, James, John, and Andrew, came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And here begins one of the most important teachings that Jesus will ever give. It's known as the Olivet Discourse because of where this teaching takes place. It takes place on the Mount of Olives. And in this discourse, this teaching, Jesus is going to answer the questions that the disciples have asked him. But before he does that, what we're going to look at today, he's going to give an overview of some end times issues, some timing issues, and he's going to share about some things that are going to unfold in the first generation of the church. In other words, during the lifetime of the disciples that he's talking with, he's going to tell them some things that are going to happen in their lifetime. 
So let me share some stuff with you first, because this is, this is a serious, scholastic study that we have to do here. This is not lightweight. This is something most churches are not going to touch because of that very, very reason. This is an intense study. In 99 out of 100 commentaries and similar resources, you're going to find Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 referred to as the Olivet Discourse. Now, it's not going to be crucial this week, but as we keep going through this in coming weeks, this is going to become important. There are some significant reasons to believe that Luke 21 is a completely different event to Matthew 24 and Mark 13. There are some distinct differences. So if you're a student of the Bible, I want to ask you to do this this, this week. Go and compare Matthew 24 with Luke 21. Read them yourself this week and see if you can figure out what the differences are and start thinking about why that might be the case. And we'll dive into that in greater detail next week. Now, for the part that we're going to talk about today, Luke 21 is essentially sharing the same thing. So even though they're different events, it's the same sort of discourse for the part we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to bring in a little bit of those things from Luke 21 because they apply to what we're talking about today. But they become two very different things next week. And we'll get into that more at that time. So in verses 4 through 8 of Matthew 24, Jesus is going to share some overarching information that he wants us to know about the time period between this moment when he's talking with the disciples and the rapture. Jesus is just going to share some overview stuff, really about what we would call the church age. It's really the time period between the moment Jesus returned to heaven in around 32 AD in what's known as the ascension, and the time the rapture happens, that future time when the church is taken to be with the Lord, removed from the earth before literally all hell breaks loose on the earth. And if this is the first you're hearing about this, you're fully justified in going, what the what? It is the most preposterous doctrine in Christianity, the rapture is. The only thing it's got going for it is that it's true. And if you want to know more about it, again, get the Revelation series, dive into that, understand it for yourself. But the time period between Jesus' return to heaven and the church going to join him in heaven, that time period is known as the church age from about 32 AD till the future time when the rapture happens. And so Jesus is going to start out with an overview of the church age. Make a note of that. Verses 4 through 8 are an overview of the church age. Just as an aside, keep in mind the disciples don't know about the rapture. They don't know about the rapture. That's a mystery. The Greek word is mysterion that is revealed to the Apostle Paul that he shares later on in later years that really ties everything together. In the portion of scripture we're going to read today, Jesus is going to refer to the end four times. He's going to use that phrase, the end, four times. I put the notes on your outline. You can study it deeper this week. One of those times, the end is going to refer to the end of their lives, the end of the disciples' lives. The other three times, the end is going to refer to the end times events. We know that we're living in the end times, but the end times events are really kicked off by the rapture and include the rapture. Then you have what's known as Daniel's 70th week, this famous seven-year time period where a lot of events happen. The Antichrist is revealed. The back half of those seven years is known as the Great Tribulation. At the end of it is the second coming of Christ. Following that is the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth known as the millennium. At the end of that is the new heaven and the new earth. So all those events together are known as the end in the discourse we're going to read today. But the end really kicks off with the rapture. Now, when we reach verses 9 through 13, Jesus is going to address things that will happen during the first generation of the church, things that will happen to the disciples in their lifetime. So make a note of that. Verses 9 through 13 refers to events that take place during the first generation of the church. The first generation of the church. And what you've got to understand as we go through the Olivet Discourse, it's so important to understand who and what Jesus is talking about in each stage. That's why I say this is a very academic, serious, scholastic study. You've really got to understand that. So keep in mind, when the disciples are asking him these questions, when is this going to happen? When's the temple going to be destroyed? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? The disciples are thinking all of these things have to be this one and the same thing. Because they're thinking the the only way that the temple gets destroyed is if it's the end of the world. 
And if it's the end of the world, we know that, that Jesus is going to be coming back and setting up his kingdom. So, so keep in mind, in the disciples' minds, their timeline is still Jesus is about to rule and reign on the earth any day now. They're days away from Jesus being crucified, but, but they don't really get that that's going to happen. So when Jesus is talking about the temple being destroyed, they're like, well, well, the only reason the temple would be destroyed is if you're starting to rule and reign and you're going to build a new one or something. So they think it's all one event. And one of the things Jesus is going to do in the Olivet Discourse is he's going to explain to them, now the temple being destroyed is going to be a separate event to the end of the age. And we're going to see that unfold as we work our way through the Olivet Discourse in its entirety. So let's jump in. Jesus' opening comments and the things he wants us all to know about believers regarding the timing of the end times. Verse 4, and Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and then underline, and will deceive many, and will deceive many. It's very interesting. History tells us that nobody had really shown up claiming to be Messiah before Jesus showed up. Very interesting. But in the hundred years following Jesus' time on the earth, a total of 64 men would show up on the scene in Israel claiming to be Messiah. And what's the reason for that? It's very simple. You, you can't create a copy. You can't make a forgery of something that doesn't exist yet. You have to have the real thing exist in order to make a forgery of it. And so once Jesus came in the hundred years that followed, there was almost an endless parade of people saying, I'm the Messiah. Men most famously like Bar Kokhba, who was endorsed by the most prominent rabbi of the time and led a revolt in Jerusalem that ended up with hundreds of thousands of people being killed because he wasn't the Messiah. It's interesting because in our day and age, the more common approach is for each person to say, I am the Christ. The idea that we're all divine, we're all gods. We all have the power to manifest our own destiny and speak our desired realities into existence. If you're not aware of this, probably most of your friends who aren't believers believe in some form of this. The idea of self-actualization, that you can create your realities by speaking and thinking and meditating them into existence. Of course, the enormous problem with that is the implication that everyone in suffering in the third world simply doesn't know the right positivity techniques to change their situation. It really falls apart upon any inspection. It's like someone once told me, I just believe if you're a good person, everything works out. And I told her, so your belief is essentially that 95 5% of the world's population are just bad people and that's why they're poor? It doesn't really hold up when you put it through just a few simple tests of logic. Luke's gospel tells us there will also be many who will say, the time's drawn near. There's going to be a lot of people saying, hey, come to my compound. Follow me. The end of the world is coming. Come and stand on top of a mountain with me. Give me your bank account details. Let's go into the future together. What do you need my bank account for if we're leaving the earth? It's not important. Jesus would say, read my word for yourself. Know what my word says so that you're not deceived, so that you don't chase those who are out to deceive you. Verse 6, he says, and you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. I mean, take your pick these days. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Underline not yet, not yet. These are almost signs that aren't signs. Jesus is saying all these things are going to happen, but, but that doesn't mean it's the end yet. What's going to happen? Verse 7, for nation will rise against nation. The original Greek word there is ethnos, which means ethnic group. So ethnic group will rise against ethnic group. Scholars also believe this points to the idea of civil wars, fighting within a country. Again, take your pick. I mean, who would have thought even, looking down south of the border from us, who would have thought that after eight years of a black president, race relations would be worse in America than they've been in probably 30 years? Who would have thought? Anti-Semitism is the worst in the world right now it's been since World War II. Jews are literally fleeing Europe for their lives. That's not even mentioning what's taking place in the Middle East where ISIS is endeavoring to wipe out entire ethnic groups and groups like Christians and the Yazidis. And on and on and on we could go. He says also we'll rise against each other, kingdom against kingdom. Did you know that before World War I, 
Almost all military conflict was essentially monarchs and kings and their armies versus other monarchs and kings and their armies. What was so unique about World War I is it was the first time it was entire kingdoms against kingdoms. It was irrelevant whether you were a trained fighter or not. If you could hold a gun, you were conscripted and you were sent to the battle line. Why? Because it's our population, our kingdom against their population, their kingdom. World War I was really the first time in history that it happened, kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines. I was thinking about this. You know, the awful thing about famine in the world today is that it's not ultimately the result of weather conditions. hundred years ago, you could blame it on a drought or something like that. Today, we have all the technology, all the food, all the transportation systems to solve every famine in the world right now. There's one reason we don't, economics. Economics. It's not profitable to solve a country's famine. So we don't do it. And the other reason famines happen today is because of wicked leaders. Take a look at Venezuela right now. People are starving because of wicked leadership in their country. So famines today have have an evil streak in them that's really unprecedented because they don't have to happen. They're the result of economic greed and wicked leadership. Next thing Jesus says is there's going to be pestilences. A pestilence is just a fatal epidemic disease, a plague. And the idea here is that they're going to be unusual pestilences. Even the the AIDS virus, uh, just when you look back at history, it's staggering, seemed to come out of nowhere in the 80s and has just ravaged the poorest of the poor across the earth. We see things like Ebola, these pestilences that seem to just be occurring with increasing frequency. And earthquakes in various places. All I'll say is this. Earthquakes today are more frequent than they've been at any other time in history. That's the scientific fact. Just Google it. In fact, go and Google this whole list of signs that Jesus gives and give yourself a prophecy update. You want to know what's going on? Just go and Google earthquakes. You'll be astounded by what you find. Verse 8, Jesus says, all these things are going to happen. And he says, but seeing a war or hearing a rumor of war, he's saying that's not the sign. It's not like you go, there was a really big war, so the end is here. This is actually what you should take note of. Verse 8, all these things are the, and then underline this phrase, beginning of sorrows. Beginning of sorrows. The Greek word that's used there for sorrows in the original is odin, odin. It's a feminine Greek noun that refers exclusively to the pangs of childbirth what we would call labor pains or labor contractions. And it's very interesting because if you've ever had any experience with that, you know that labor pains become progressively more and more intense and closer and closer together. So scholars are pretty much in agreement that what Jesus is pointing to here is he's saying this whole list, earthquakes, famines, wars, rumors of war, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, all these things as the end approaches are going to get more and more intense and happen more and more frequently. And that's how you're going to know that things are accelerating. So make a note of this. Everything Jesus lists will occur with increasing frequency and intensity as the end times approach. Increasing frequency and intensity. And don't be fooled by thinking, oh, those things aren't really happening. You know what happens in our world? It's the news cycle. If there's a horrible earthquake somewhere, It's not good news to share the next earthquake that happens a week later. People are already tired of hearing about earthquakes. They want something else. That's how the news cycle works. That's why if you go and do your own research, you'll be astounded by the magnitude and volume of earthquakes happening all over the world. There are wars going on that we don't hear anything about in North America simply because the media has figured out people don't care. People don't care. But these things are happening. So all of that was part of an overview of the end times. And now, in verses 9 through 13, Jesus will share with his disciples the things that will unfold in their future during the first generation of the church. And again, the reason we know this is because there are very specific things here that only really happen to the first generation church. As you'll see in verse 9, it begins with then. But there's some issues in the original language. Luke's gospel makes it a bit clearer. If you looked at Luke 21 too. At this point in his discourse, Jesus says, but before all these things. So that's the perspective you need to know. It's but before all these things happen, these kingdoms against kingdoms, nations against nations. Before all these things happen, let me tell you about what's going to happen to you guys. Verse 9, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated 
by all nations for my name's sake. This was the story of the early church. Some of you will remember. For the first 250 years of its existence, the church was under intense persecution as a wave of 10 consecutive Caesars sought to passionately persecute the church out of their hatred for Christianity. During those 250 years, 5 to 7 million believers are martyred. And here's where the number becomes truly mind-blowing. So you hear 5 to 7 million and you're like, oh, that's like the Holocaust. But let me put this in perspective. Take it back and let's look at what percentage of the world's population 5 to 7 million was during the first 250 years A.D. If we converted that percentage to today, it would be as though over the last 250 years, 253 million, 864,104 Christians had been killed. Over a million a year. That's what it would equate to in today's population terms. Over a million a year. Mark's gospel adds this, Jesus saying, they'll deliver you up to councils. The word there is Sanhedrin. That's the the judgment court of each local synagogue. And you'll be beaten in the synagogue. You'll be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it's not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Jesus is telling them these dark moments of persecution are going to provide some incredible opportunities for you to share your testimony in front of very, very important people. And indeed, the disciples and apostles of the early church would testify before Caesars and kings and governors. Luke's gospel records Jesus saying, I'll give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. And we do well to remember this because how many of us go to to great lengths and great pains to figure out what we would say if we were put on the spot and asked to defend our faith. We'll practice and rehearse how the the conversation will go and we'll have such a good comeback. And have you ever noticed you get in this situation and it never goes like that? It never goes like that. So yes, it's important to be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have in Jesus. But Jesus' encouragement to us is this. Hey, don't be confident because you think you've got a great response prepared. Be confident because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you and he'll give you the words that need to be said in that moment. Don't be confident in a prepared statement. Be confident in the power of the Holy Spirit. But what about those times when I am confident and I share and all that comes out is you should love Jesus because he's really great and you don't want to go to hell. Like what about those times? I don't feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking through me. You know, there's nothing you can do to save a person. Nobody's salvation rests on you. You are accountable to share what the Lord asks you to share. You're not accountable for the other person's response. God is doing something bigger than you. Bigger than me. We just get to be a part of what God is doing. You be obedient to him and leave the rest to him. You're not going to get to heaven and God's going to say, man, remember that time I asked you to share with Steve? Man, did you screw that up. That's not going to happen. There have been so many times where you share something and you feel like a blubbering idiot. And what that person heard through the power of the Holy Spirit was something completely different. God is using you when you're obedient to him. Just be obedient. That's it. I really do understand this. Because I get up here every week and I could drive myself crazy with thoughts of... Did I really make an impact? Did I penetrate people's hearts? Did I change everybody's life? You know, the truth is I can't do any of that. I can't do any of that. All I can do is my best to share the truth of God's word and leave the rest up to him. That's all the Lord has asked any of us to do when it comes to evangelism. Share when he asks you to share. Don't think it all depends on you. Trust in the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's the big principle. Write this down. At the time of the trial, you'll have the grace and wisdom you need. At the time of the trial, you'll have the grace and wisdom you need. That'll preach. And somebody in here needs to hear that one thing. That's for somebody in here today. You're worried about all these what-ifs in the future. How will I get through it if this happens? I, I don't know what I'll do. I can't see how I would make it if that happened. Stop stressing. Stop stressing. In the time when it's needed, you'll have the grace and the wisdom you need. But not before. Not before. Corrie ten Boom said that in her old age she had come to realize 
God doesn't give you dying grace until you're dying. When you think, man, how, how am I going to walk through loving God when I'm old and can't eat solid foods? How am I going to do that? Corey ten Boom would say, listen, you'll have the grace to die well when you start dying. God will give you what you need. When you look at believers who are martyred for their faith and you're thinking, I, I, I don't know if I could hold to my faith when I was being threatened with death. Hey, the grace to get through that and to do that is given in the moment when it's needed. You don't need it, so you don't have it right now. We all have places we're afraid to go. We all have places we're afraid to end up. But here's what we need to know. If we ever end up in one of those places, Jesus will be there too. He will be in that place as well. That's all we need to know. That's all we need to know. So if you're terrified about somewhere that your life could take you, terrified about a situation or a reality that you can end up in, and you think, what will I do if I get there? Here's what you need to know. You'll find Jesus because he'll be there too. He'll be there too. And that's enough. Verse 10, and then many will be offended. That means caused to stumble. Will betray one another and will hate one another. Luke's gospel says it like this. You'll be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. You see, to ensure their own safety. During that first generation of the church, family members would betray and rat out even their own families, their own parents, their own brothers. And sometimes these would be people who everyone thought were believers. But this wasn't new information, was it? Remember what Jesus told his disciples back in Matthew 10. Let me read it to you. He said, do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus said that this is going to happen. The kingdom of God, a relationship with God, salvation, that is more important than any other relationship you have. And Jesus says, listen, choosing me is going to divide some families. And if you think that it's more important that the families stay together than that you experience the saving grace of God, you don't deserve the saving grace of God. That's what Jesus said. Hard words. And it happened. Verse 11, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness, underline lawlessness, will abound, the love of many will grow cold, underline cold. You see, the word lawlessness doesn't just mean bad stuff. It's the Greek word anemia. And it's defined as the condition of without laws. It's a rejection of the very idea that there are moral laws that we are bound to. And it's the type of thinking that was prevalent in the Roman Empire during the first generation of the church. The philosophy of hedonism. If it feels good, do it. And that is enough justification for doing it. Pursue pleasure at all costs. That is the philosophy of hedonism. The cult of the Dionysians. You can Wikipedia that. Don't do it with the kids around. The removal of moral restraint under the guise of philosophical enlightenment. Stop me if this sounds familiar. The idea that you should pursue pleasure because you're being held back by moral constraints that are simply a figment of your imagination. And to be truly enlightened, to be truly free, you need to shake off the constraints of imaginary morality and do whatever it is that you want to do. That's true enlightenment. This was the philosophy of the Roman Empire. And the decadence of this school of philosophy is what would ultimately lead to the fall of the western half of the Roman Empire. Western half of the Roman Empire was never conquered. It collapsed under the weight of its own decadence. Its society collapsed without a moral foundation. And I know we're cramming a lot of information into this message, but this stuff is so, so important. As sin ran rampant, Many chose sin over Jesus. Persecution and death or sex and parties in honor of Roman gods. I'll go with sex and parties and Roman gods. That's the choice a lot of people made. I want you to notice this. Jesus specifically links lawlessness, unrighteousness, sin 
wickedness. He specifically links that with love growing cold. Did you catch that? He says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. In other words, the lawlessness will be the cause of love growing cold. When we allow sin into our lives, when we embrace it and don't fight against it, the inevitable result is that love and passion will diminish. So write this down and we'll unpack this. Sin causes love to diminish in all our relationships. Sin causes love to diminish in all our relationships. Why? Because sin separates us from God. And as the word says, God is love. So the further you get from the definition of love, the less you are able to share and express it with anyone else. Because you forget what it looks like. You've got to know what love is before you can experience and share that with anyone else. And when you block love out of your life, it diminishes in all of your relationships. It's a natural consequence. It's true in marriage. It's true in parenting. It's true when it comes to your brothers and sisters in the church. And it's true when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. Sin causes our love to diminish for the Lord and everyone else. So don't believe these two popular lies concerning sin. Because what Jesus said just has blown up these two lies. Here's the first lie. My secret sin is not affecting anyone else. It's not affecting anyone else. Nobody can see what I'm doing with him or her or the computer. Nobody can see it. It's not affecting anyone else. Jesus says that sin, lawlessness, causes your love to grow cold. Even what you're doing in secret is going to cause your love to grow cold and diminish your ability to love others well. Second lie, I can get it together later on. You know, I'll stop looking at porn when I'm in a meaningful relationship. You know, I'll I'll stop sleeping around when when I I find the right person and it's time to settle down. These are my years. This is my season in life to express myself and and enjoy sin. And then then I'll get serious later on in life when, when I reach that season. You know, the visuals that we take in and the things that we experience, the sins that we indulge in have a way of becoming seared into our brain. And here's what I know about you because this is a common shared human experience and this is true in my own life. It is so much easier for Satan to draw us to sin by stirring up a memory of a sin that we committed or something we consumed in the world of media and cause us to play it over in our head again and get us going that way. So much easier for Satan to work with pre-existing material with a memory than it is to take you and get you to do that sin again. So when we say, I'll just get it together later on, here's what we're doing. We're literally sabotaging our future By giving Satan all the ammunition that he needs to cause us to struggle with those sins way into our future. Way into our future. You might think, man, I'll get it together when I'm in a serious relationship. You're sabotaging that serious relationship right now. You're sabotaging it. It's a lie. Don't give Satan the ammo to sabotage your future. Lawlessness, sin, causes our love to grow cold. Verse 13, Jesus says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Please understand this. He's not saying if you endure, you'll be saved. He's saying if you're saved, you'll endure. It's meant as an encouragement. It's not meant as a warning. 1 Peter 5 tells us that true believers are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, we provide the faith. God provides the perseverance and the endurance. And never forget, I put this, I think I snuck it on the bottom of your outline. I love Jesus' promise in John 10. Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. When you belong to Jesus, you belong to Jesus. So back to our text. He's just shared some very difficult things are coming the disciples' way in the future. And so he ends this portion of the Olivet Discourse with an encouragement for them. He says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. He's saying, guys, none of the stuff I've told you, no matter how scary it is, none of that is going to overcome my plans for you and the church. None of that's going to stop the gospel. None of it's going to stop the church. Everything will go as planned. And the story of the gospel in the church is that the worse the persecution gets, the more the gospel explodes. 
Despite 10 waves of persecution under 10 Caesars in the first 250 years of the church and the genocide that took place, the result of that was the gospel being scattered and spread and exploding across the earth. And the gospel will indeed and pretty much has penetrated every corner of the globe. So remember when Jesus says, then the end will come, he's referring to the beginning of that whole set of end times events, beginning with the rapture. Next week, as Jesus continues, he's going to get to the disciples' specific questions. When will the temple be destroyed? What will be the signs of your coming? He's going to get into that next week, so don't miss that. This is the promise Jesus gives in Luke's gospel at the end of this section. He says, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience possess your souls. Seems really weird at first. He's like, you're going to be handed over, you're going to be beaten, and they're going to kill a bunch of you, but not a hair in your head shall be harmed. So what does he mean by that? Well, this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen, even if your earthly body is destroyed, you will have lost nothing. Nothing. Really let that sink in. Even if everything you have in this life is destroyed, you will have lost nothing. It will have been as though not a hair on your head was harmed from the perspective of eternity. He's telling them, you're going to wake up in heaven in my presence, in the presence of my Father, and when you see what you've gained you're going to realize that you've lost nothing by dying for me. Every disciple who lost their lives for Jesus is in heaven today with a full head of hair, not a single hair harmed. That might be more precious to me than some of you. Not a single hair harmed. Well, what does Jesus mean when he says, by your patience possess your souls? This is for us right here, right now. He's saying, don't freak out. Don't stress out. When these things happen that I'm telling you about, Fear is going to come marching into your life. It's going to try and possess you. It's going to try and take over your soul. It's going to try and dominate your life. Be patient. Don't let it. Let God's plan unfold. Bring those fears under submission to the word of God. And by doing that, possess your souls. Don't let your soul be possessed by fear. You take possession of your soul by bringing that fear into submission under the word of God. And how do you do that? By being patient. By not going, everything's going wrong today, so everything will go wrong forever. There is no God. I'm left and we're doomed. You say, don't, don't do that. Be patient. Give the plan of God, the work of God, a little bit of room to work out. Give him some time. And this applies to every situation we face in life that causes fear to well up within us. You look back at God's faithfulness in your life and say, he's always taking care of me. Take a deep breath and you say, therefore, he'll continue to be the same God he was yesterday and the day before. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was faithful then. He's faithful today. He'll be faithful tomorrow. Don't freak out. Don't let fear possess your souls. Have faith. Be patient. Don't let fear possess your soul. I'll wrap up with this. The widow we read about at the beginning of our study is the role model that Jesus provides for us in the area of giving and tithing and trusting God with money. She's the role model that Jesus gives us. So today the question is very simple. Does your attitude, does my attitude line up with hers? Does it line up? Do we give in faith? Do we give sacrificially? Do we trust that God is going to take care of us by giving to him first? Or do we give to him what's left over? Jesus would say the issue is not dollars and cents. The issue is your attitudes. Second thing to ask ourselves, sin causes love to grow cold, to diminish. Have you bought into one of those lies, those two lies? Hey, what I'm doing in secret, my secret sin, that's not going to affect anybody. Or the second lie, man, I'll, I'll get it together later on when things get serious. Your secret sin is affecting all of your most important relationships right now. And the attitude that says I'll get it together later on is really sabotaging that later on right now. If that's you, just repent today. Repent. Ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask him to cleanse you. Ask him to deliver you from those things and begin to, to walk in that new freedom and then get up tomorrow and do the same thing again. 
You can bet your life Satan's going to want to fill your mind with condemnation and shame and stir up all those images and all those things that you've done. Do the same thing again tomorrow. Thank you, God, that I'm forgiven and keep walking in faith. And then lastly, don't worry about future issues. Don't worry about it. You'll have the wisdom and the grace you need when the moment comes. Until then, why don't you go have some time with the counselor, the Holy Spirit, the counselor of counselors, and do what Peter counseled us to do. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. There's no excuse for Christians being stressed. There's no excuse. We've got free counseling available. Go see the counselor today if you need to. Let's pray. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And then, Father, right now, we just want to come before you honestly. And, Lord, if there's an area where it's hard to trust you, Lord, it's, it's money for so many of us, so many of us who love you. We have the pressure of bills. We've got high taxation. And it just seems like so often there's never enough to go around. But, Father, we don't want this issue to be about dollars and cents. We want it to be about you. And so, Father, I pray right now that if any of us are being ruled by fear in the area of money, that we would possess our souls in the name of Jesus and choose to have an attitude that says, I serve a God who takes care of me. I serve a God who deserves my trust. And so I don't give to him reluctantly. I gladly accept his invitation to bless my life in this area. We trust you. And then, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for anybody here who's dealing with a secret sin or buying into the lie that what they're doing right now won't affect their future. Lord, your word says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so we just recognize right now that those are lies from an enemy who doesn't want to see our lives blessed. They're lies from an enemy that wants to bring about our destruction in every area of our lives. In Jesus' name, I pray for the person who's struggling with that, that your Holy Spirit would right now just make it so clear, so clear that those lies have put them on a path to destruction in the area of their relationships. I pray you'll just reveal those lies for what they are and give them the strength in Jesus' name to turn towards you, Lord God. Father, we love you. We trust you. And we put our faith in you. Lastly, I pray for anyone here that needs some time with the counselor, the Holy Spirit. As we said, Lord, there is no reason for us to be stressed. The God of the universe is on our side. And so in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that every fear, every stress, every bit of anxiety will be given to you today. And we'll instead say, listen, my God is my provider, so I know the situations I'm in tomorrow, he'll provide what I need for those. The situations I'm in the day after that, he'll provide what I need for that. The situations I find myself in in one year, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, God will give the grace and the wisdom when I need it. And so I refuse to be possessed by fear today. I refuse. By patience and faith in God, I will possess my soul.